So we often say things like seeing is believing or I saw it with my own eyes. But today, computers can duplicate someone's image and recreate their voice, photos, and videos. So how does that change our concept of reality? This week, I wanted to talk to someone who's been working in AI since its formative years. My name is Ray Villalobos, and I'm a software engineer and senior staff instructor at LinkedIn Learning. So today, I'm talking to Noel Silver. Noel is the chief AI strategy at the AI Leadership Institute, and she's been working in technology for more than 20 years and has been specializing in AI since she helped train Amazon's Alexa, that person that's always listening to us. Noel, <laughs> talk a little bit about your journey through technology and maybe then uh, discovering and finally starting to work through AI. Absolutely. Wonderful to be here. Um, thanks for having me. This is amazing. Uh, yeah, my I love uh, the way I love AI for a very specific reason, and that is mainly because um, I feel like it's an industry where anyone can play. Uh, and I got interested in playing in my early days uh, at AWS. I was working as a principal cloud, like I was in the cloud architecture world, right, doing um, cloud things. Uh, and all of a sudden, there was an interesting email that went out by Jeff Bezos and the team about how we were doing this cool new thing, Amazon Alexa. And uh, of course, at that time, nobody knew what that was or what it would mean. But I, of course, jumped at the opportunity with no skills in that area. I always tell people I'm not classically trained. However, I dove in quick. I uh, jumped into you know dozens and dozens, now hundreds of GitHub repositories um, and used it a bit like artist tracing paper to learn all the things that I do now. Um, and then I, you know, the nice thing about that is, of course, I started my journey at Alexa. I was able to be part of the data science org and all the cool things we did there, massive lessons learned. But then I also went, um, I left there after four years and went to Microsoft to help with cognitive services and very similarly take these little models and make them big models. And how do we, you know, take things that were research projects and turn them into big AI. And we're seeing a lot of that happen in the generative AI space again now. So it's interesting to have been part of a couple of different trends that are now showing up in a big way in this kind of chat GPT world that we're in. Yeah, what I find so weird about all this happening today is that this has really been around for quite a while, but it's just now that people are kind of getting into it. They are really sort of establishing as the the biggest cultural change in the history of technology for everyone. Even though, and you know, if you think about it, you know, Alexa, Siri, like all those AIs have been around for quite a while. So every That's week right. I do a poll to sort of uh, see how people are feeling about the topic. So my poll this week was this one right here. What's your biggest concerns with society's oh, ability Lord. to use deep fakes and other synthetically generated concept and the options were threats to the concept of reality and that's actually as you can see the check mark that's actually how i voted unauthorized manipulation threats to privacy and political misinformation so what's your take on sort of the, this question and this poll noel and any surprises about sort of the the you know structure of the results here no i mean i'm i'm probably maybe i guess because there's four options it got distributed a little bit more i would say i would have expected a little bit more on the the reality side. I think the biggest area that I see people really wondering about is how do we make sure as the rest of the world starts consuming information generated by AI, like there's a few of us, right? We have a, our special group that knows what generative AI is, how it's built, um, how we create it, how we're using prompt engineering. But the rest of the world, like my grandparents, right? Like my dad, like my, even my kids, they're consuming this information. And I, we want to start thinking about like, A, is it the truth that these models are generating? Like, is that accurate? And then how do we stamp that accuracy, right? How do we verify it? Um, so that's kind of the, one of the bigger questions that I see. Um, but I like I like all these. These are, these are fair uh, questions. I think I got into uh, deep fakes very uh, intensely during the election year a few years ago. Uh, which is when we did that class uh, at LinkedIn around deep fakes. We had like 3 million plus students go through that class because it was a very interesting time, right? Where we were like, okay, if anyone can look like Donald Trump and anyone with any political agenda could tell you in Donald Trump's voice and face what was being said, what does that do? Like, what could they say he said that he never said that could cause a war? And that was a really interesting, so that's why reality, I think, is 
is one of those things that we want to figure out how do we make sure people know that they're what they're seeing is real or synthesized because that should be a stamp that we're you know we're providing to things and i know big companies like adobe um are working on this right for for content generated in those types of platforms but what about everything else yeah that's so true and it's for one it's isn't it weird when you meet somebody uh, who just doesn't have a clue about what's going on. It feels like we're like in this inside joke. I was talking yeah, to yeah. my sisters the other day, you know, and it's, sometimes it's hard. Like I meet people that don't know what LinkedIn is. I have to oh. go back to the Microsoft, <laughs> like, but I, I was talking to them and they're like, you know, oh, have you heard of ChatGPT? I assume everybody has heard of it by now. And they were like, no, what is that? So I had to like back up and back up and yeah, back yeah. up and explain all these things. So I feel it's like actually it's actually a good it's, lesson though, because we often do that, right? We often, right. our world, we dive into a tech and we like, I feel like it's old hat. Like we've been talking about this for months and, um, I know. but that's not true for the users of this and who will be impacted by it. They never have that visibility. That's true. That's true. And um, I think the, what's weird is just to um, kind of understand that we need to sort of slow down in how we approach talking about this and communicating with people about this. So I actually want to back up a little bit and have you go in and explain sure. a little bit about the technology that's making something like deep fakes possible. Yes. So we don't, I won't go too far because we go too far, it'll get super technical. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the idea, especially around um, all of the newness around chat GPT is this concept of generation, right? Generative technology. So I'll give you a really great example of how it started um, for some of the work I was doing at Microsoft, where we wanted to go in and we ended up working with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We took the curators and a lot of the, you know, the domain experts in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We partnered with MIT's data scientists um, and their team. And we brought them in kind of like an awkward high school dance and sat them next to each other um, and said, OK, what what if we could build anything? What would we build? And one of the outcomes of that, there were lots of outcomes, um, but one of them was a GAN, um, which is this type of uh, machine learning model that would be generative in nature and it would generate art and the immediate response to a generating a, a art generation tool was a well that's not art <laughs> like how could that be <laughs> art that's being generated on art that was already built and we're actually seeing this play out in legal systems all over america um mm -hmm. that how do we you know what what is generation if it's based on something and how do we protect the lineage of what these things are based on but the technology itself really is about how do we identify signals in existing information, like existing sets of data, whether it's call center data, whether it's healthcare data, to do predictions, but then generate new content, like new patient plans or new product designs or even new product marketing. Um, all use cases that we're seeing generative AI used in today. I'd say the deep fake side of the house probably is sticking more towards like propaganda and what if I want to use a persona to represent an idea and that persona either isn't available, meaning they've passed away and that's kind of a more ethical use case or an unethical use case. I don't have their permission. They don't know that I'm doing it and I'm going to do it anyway. In either case, we end up with content that looks like it's said pretty authentically by someone who never actually said it and didn't give their permission or is not around to give their permission to do that work. All right. So you also mentioned in that description something that I think yeah you, you probably want to like describe a little more. You mentioned again one of the things that you were using was again. So can you describe what that is, uh, sure. just so that everybody knows where we're coming from? Yes, and it, it kind of becomes a rabbit hole. So a general adversarial network <laughs> basically is like the brain, a human brain. <laughs> um, right. It's based on a bunch of different uh, algorithmic advancements that have happened over the years, and we're actually seeing a lot of that generative capability in. The models we're seeing today, like GPT, like um, Codex, like Dolly, right? Some of these base, what we call foundation models. Um, but this GAN specifically, this one, um, gives us the ability to look at art, break it down to its most finite pieces, and reform new art in its place. So I could tell it, it's similar to um, Mid Journey or to mm -hmm. actually maybe as better 
oh, is that one? I mean, even Dolly at OpenAI, right? You could go in and you could say, hey, I'd like to see a Degas-like photo, but instead of it being a young Caucasian girl, could it please be a Hispanic girl with curly hair? And the image now, because I've been able to, through this machine learning model, break it into its most tiniest parts, it can build back the impressionist look of Degas but replace it with the features I'm asking it for. Um, and that's really the power of it, right? Is that we now can repeat patterns we see across artistic types, styles, um, you know, and of course that's just in the art world, music, bass lines, but we can use it to generate new forms of that art based on known patterns. That's interesting. And I think you mentioned a lot of the issues are really around how do we use the stuff and whether or not those uses are warranted. So like you mentioned the political sort of issues with using yes. somebody's yes. deep fake. And in this case, somebody made, I think, a, a picture of Zelensky, uh, Zelensky, and he was actually, uh, um, you know, um, you, you know, saying that he was given up the war that he was given up, you know, and, and, you know, just think about in a world where you can bombard, you know, the culture with a lot of that information in a fog of war type environment, that's definitely like a, a dangerous use of this technology. But you've seen like fun, maybe more fun yeah. uses of the technology. Like, so Tom, there's like, right? there's like, <laughs> yeah, the Tom, there's like a TikTok dedicated to Tom Cruise. And there's like, uh, you know, here's a picture of uh, Nick Cage in like every yeah, movie. Yeah. So there's like all these different movies that they place Nick Cage in. And this is a, a, one of the Batman movies, I think Dark Knight yeah. Rises. And they just took him and they just said, this is great. <laughs> this is that movie, <laughs> that really bad movie, The Artist. And uh, here he is as a Superman's girlfriend. And it's great because I love his face right now. And then when you turn around, you see that it's actually Nick Cage. It's, it's like pretty, you know, it's a lot of fun in a way. But you can see where it could be kind of dangerous. Here's, you know, one of I'm Morgan Freeman's Freeman. saying that's not Morgan Freeman. And I mean, I feel like you can still tell the difference between kind of a good one and, and you can in the voice, but even that seems to be going away, right? So oh, absolutely. Um, I think that's the important thing is, is that all, I mean, even again has been evolved uh, against, like that was what we did four years ago. That technology has now, you know, been, we, we've evolved past that to leverage some of the generative AI capabilities we're seeing in Dolly and in, um, you know, in, in some of these applications uh, like Lenza and Mid Journey, where they're able to to create really compelling um, solutions. We also are seeing the cost of implementation be kind of democratized or commoditized, right? So that's one of the things before is you had to be pretty uh, well stacked from an infrastructure perspective to even try and do or, or load an, enough data into a model to generate this type of work. Now there's like, you know, 100, 140 different software as a service platforms that'll, and we even have apps you can just load onto your phone that allow you to do face swaps with any celebrity. I'm not sure those celebrities said, sure, you can face swap with me. Pretty sure mm -hmm. they did it. Right. Um, but, but that's part of like the world we're moving into is democratizing access to being able to use this technology to change and create assets. But yeah, ethics and really more responsible use of this really needs to come into play. Yeah, we have to start asking like the different questions about, you know, I think celebrities are an easy target because legally they have less protections than I think most people's. But what about somebody who's not famous? Like, what are the ethical consequences of you just putting somebody, you know, in, you know, you yourself in a movie or somebody yeah. else, maybe one of your friends without their consent in a movie? Uh, I think that one of the examples that I saw this week was that the NBA release this sort of new application that allows you to take instead of put yourself in the game i don't know if you've seen this one yeah, so yeah. basically you you scan yourself and uh, shot, then uh, i don't know if i don't know if you can hear this but i'm going to turn off the, the volume here yeah. but basically uh, you know the i don't know i think nba i okay uh i'm going to say i know very little basketball I mean, I played basketball in high school, not very well. I quit the team to Play join the computer TV. science club. Best move I ever made. However, <laughs> I, I know enough to be dangerous about basketball. So basically, this is the NBA commissioner, Adam Silver, and he's taken a scan of this gentleman over here. And then uh, this is pretty cool. Like in real time, he actually places replaces an existing player. So he, you know, you yeah. can go in and in, in an actually in an ongoing game, you know, currently going game, you can go in there and select a player and replace yourself 
uh, you know, put yourself in the game, I guess. And like, who would want to yeah. do that? I, I don't know. It's, you know, and hey, I, I was like, lo- I was looking at this. <laughs> is that, you know, I, maybe I've lost the passion for basketball, so, you know, since I uh, st- stopped being able to shoot and dribble and stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm just wondering, like, is that something people want? I mean, to be able to do, I mean, what are your thoughts on something like this? I mean, this seems to be like where we're going. I mean, it, it's it's cool if you maybe put yourself in the game. But what if you put somebody else in the game? Uh, you know, is how does it, it just this like sort of freak me out as well as uh, made me, I don't know, excited <laughs> about the possibilities as well. It's kind of a weird feeling. Understood. Yeah, I think the good news is, is that this technology is getting to the point where it's democratized, where any niche area can use it, right? Like, so basketball fans now get access to it. The same thing is true for, um, I'll give you a more AI for good kind of story, right? It was uncovered in um, Portland that there was a whole sea of uh, people in the ages where we were um, doing railroad track work there that a whole bunch of families um, died in that process or a bunch of people Mm -hmm. died in that process. Their families never able to memorialize the people who passed away. And now we were able to go in and through, you know, generative AI be able to create personas that represent those people. And when you go, you can actually hold up your phone or put on a metaverse, you know, uh, experience and walk around the town that they were laid in and get tombstones that are artificial. And um, Mm -hmm. so I think, there's, there's ways for this technology to be used. Another thing is also what I was working on with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. One of the use cases that came out of that hackathon uh, was being able to just have real people like Pablo Picasso or Benjamin Franklin be able to be re-imaged in 3D with their voice, should we have it, where I can actually talk to them and they are knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. It's like having a conversation with the actual person, not the not the natural language of last year where it's choppy and you know you could tell you're talking to a robot, they don't know a lot of answers. Like the mm-hmm. world of generative AI gives us the ability to create much more useful conversations that end in useful answers. Now, content, I always tell people this, like content verification and moderation are a huge part of how we do that. That's what the work I get to do at Accenture is making sure that we don't just get excited about the cool functionality of generative AI, but we realize the impact of what that will do to how we do things both as employees, but also as customers. And we really have to build a protective, you know, ecosystem of activity to support that. Yeah, definitely. So a lot of technology has been sort of, um, you know, moving, like you said, in in the direction of making things indistinguishable from reality. So one of the examples that, you know, we've been seeing is uh, like, for example, this example from OpenAI called Whisper. We saw Google introduce like a music example that was able to generate all kinds of music. So can you talk about like, I feel like people sort of understand how (laughs) something like ChatGPT works, you know, using transformers to synthesize you know, things, but how is something that is synthesizing, you know, voice or video or photos, what's the difference between the technology and those things? Yeah. So I think the first thing is that I don't think a lot of people understand how it works. <laughs> I would. Yeah. I would maybe, probably... maybe they feel like. Yeah. <laughs> it feels um, it feels like it just works like how you would work, I feel like, you know what I mean? But yeah. like there, there's something about... I, you know, people yeah, know so- that, that I think that's what captured them, <laughs> that they felt like, oh, I know how I do how I write an essay. So this thing's just doing what I do. But, you know, not everybody yeah. like creates yeah, bits I would love and stuff. to give like a kind of an overview of, of the backbone, if you yeah. will, um, and why why it's such an interesting time and why people get wrong answers oftentimes mm. with this chat GPT thing. Um, yeah. But if you're using a tool like chat GPT and there's lots of other ones, I mean, I, I compare, I compare all of these generative AI kind of models um, are very similar in nature, which means they start with a base model that's been trained on lots of data. So let's say chat GPT, for example, right? 1.75 billion parameters of data um, complicated mm. by 499 million, uh, you know, conversations that it's adding across hundreds, thousands of websites that it's curated it from. 
but it's still a curation process, right? So there was a, you know, GPT stands for generative pre-trained, right? Transformer. Transformer is not new, right? We saw BERT and lots, we, a huge evolution in natural language in like 2017 and, and forward on, okay, great. Now we can, you know, we can fix the short-term memory thing. We can fix different, you know, so challenges. BERT, Bert is not the, not the guy with Ernie. It's BERT is like an early AI, right? That's what you're talking about. That's right. About. Well, it's an, yes. it's an early, it's a transformer model. One of the first mm -hmm. that, and a lot of organizations, organizations only had kind of natural language they had built from scratch up until that point. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, so, yeah, and what, so what what happened after BERT? <laughs> How do yeah, we get so, to even chat right, GPT? Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's like an evolution, right? We started to see it's just fast. Usually, at least in my, you know, I, I started off and, you know, in 10 years we did, uh, we went from like, you know, COBOL kind of things to client server. Another 10 years, we went to cloud. Another 10 years, we, you know, we had mobile. Like there, there were big time frames that this happened in. Now it's happening in like months and years. Um, but as the good news is that this work wasn't new, right? It was just in research. It hadn't been productized. It hadn't been brought to market. And we're now bringing AI models that have been researched for a long time to market faster than ever. And so GPT mm. being one of them is an evolution of that transformer model that changes how natural language operates. It evolves it. It makes it easier. But most importantly, it's a foundation model. It's trained on a ton of foundational data that now a client doesn't have to, like you don't have to go after and find if you want to use it. Key, generally knowledgeable about a, a lot of things. Right. Mm -hmm. It's got a wide breadth of understanding. It doesn't have a fine level of understanding on anything. So if you dive deep enough, and this is what I always tell people to do, just start asking very specific questions. Eventually you'll uncover that moment where it's like, oh, yeah, I don't have that because I don't know that. And it's not wrong. It's just untrained. So that's the work of kind of everyone now. If you talk to Sam Alton and and um, Greg Brockman over at OpenAI, they will tell you the future of this is in the specialization, it's in the fine tuning. How do I get a chat GPT to know my company, to know my product, to know my service, mm -hmm. to know how to generate my code? Because let's face it, we can ask it to generate code, but would that code pass all the uses, you know, all the, the requirements of my own enterprise environment? Probably not, because it doesn't know to do that. So we can train it though to do that. And that's that's, I think, the huge opportunity we have, right, is that I can actually not just use a accelerator, but one that's custom trained on how mm -hmm. on how I best do my work. And that is, I think, is where we'll spend a lot of time this year figuring out for companies. Yeah, I think that if you think that ChatGPT is going to take over the world, you should try using it, and then you'll know that it's definitely not going to be taking yeah, over the GPT, world. Right? Yeah, not <laughs> ChatGPT, right? Yeah. It's not going to take over your, yeah, it's not going to take over like your, um, coding anytime soon so I, ha I have this like a uh, sort of series of pro progression for how good image generation has gotten over the years and this actually came from one of my previous uh, episodes episode two with Pinar Sehan Lee who has this fantastic product called Kubrick but what I loved about this was just how before like 2014 to like maybe 2020 it was just trying to do a good job of making it look like people. But right. then it started to get really creative, like in 21 and 22, yeah, where, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, you look at these photos and you're like, well, who it's it's gone past being able to be good at generating people. It just started generating like, I mean, the pictures of dogs are great, but like just kind of like a, a bad photo. That's, true. I guess, maybe the true test, like the, the actual being able to uh, do bad photos. Maybe that's the that's the I don't know, the golden time of, of yeah, generative I mean, AI. And, and I always tell people like this model was trained for if you read, you know, anytime you go into these models and use them, even chat GPT at the bottom, it's like this is for research purposes. Like it's not built to solve a problem. It's not a specific right. one anyway. And so the the opportunity lies in how do we get it to solve a very specific problem? Like, man, what if. I, as a developer, I've built, you know, I don't know, millions of lines of code in my career. What if I could take the best of the best code that I've ever written and that becomes the scaffolding or the starter for everything I do now? My efficiency mm -hmm. goes through the roof because oftentimes I will have just taken a class and I do something perfect the next project. By the time I get two projects later, I've forgotten the thing that I learned in that class and my That's code right. is, you know, <laughs> it's not consistently awesome. And so we can improve that consistency. And let's face it, there aren't enough software engineers on the planet to do the work we need to do 
anyway. So productivity mm -hmm. improvement through a code generation tool like Codex um, or really an application of that like GitHub Copilot. Like, there is massive productivity gains to be seen industry wide using something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And you, 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 you know, so. I mean, uh, GitHub just released GitHub for Business the other day. And yeah. if you look at the documentation, they just show you like the incredible advances in productivity that developers have. I and I've been using it for quite a while and I'm super happy with it. The other day I like gave it a refactoring job. I'm like, I'm just curious to see what it oh, would yeah, do with exactly. my code. And, and it did like a great job. I'm like, wow, this is actually really good. Um, yes. You know, and so it, it's really good at some things, but like you said, sometimes they get things wrong and I feel like it has an attitude about it. Like sometimes I, I call this, I call this like Chad GPT, like because it, it will tell you an answer, but it'll do so authoritatively. So, you know, that's I think one of the problems that you can't trust it if you ask it questions like about me or about things. Uh, it it yeah, sometimes this is it a great like point, actually yeah, it makes exactly. it makes an answer, but then it like authoritatively tries to make you feel like you're bad. It's like when my dad tells me something and I know he's wrong, but I think like well he's he's being so authoritative that I I think he's yeah. right. Maybe I'm wrong, you know. So what do yeah. you think about well, those and, things? And the important thing to know about that is that these are hyperparameters we tune. We can tune how authoritative an answer is. We can tune whether how confident we are in an answer before we say it. We can we can provide like that's context that just like again when you're using a research model they don't care that much about. But if you're using it in production to serve a customer request or to build software for your company, like these are all parameters. There's in in cases hundreds of these hyper parameters that you can tune to tell the model how to respond in certain use cases what happens when there's you know some contingent you know some contingent information we need before we make a better decision like there's a lot of capability in the model itself that we're all making a lot of judgments about the capability of this through really a single application of it chatgpt is just an application of this we're going to see the GPT engine, if you will, right, be used mm. in a multimodal fashion across a ton of use cases, not just conversation. Can you answer a question for me? But can you help me get my insurance benefits activated? Can you take a, I'm going to be on WhatsApp and I want to send you a, a picture of my, you know, insurance card and have you process it or give you my driver's license and have you start a, a form like all those things are part of what GPT can automate that we currently have humans doing a lot of that and those humans are not necessarily attached to that work right they're much likely well my job really is to process problems that happen in that and they're focused on just running the human process and we've done a lot of rpa in this space but gpt can help really infuse a lot more kind of human intuitive communication in that process in the rpa stuff that we've been working on over the last few years yeah, uh, I somebody in the chat is saying pretty much what I what I mentioned that they feel like uh, G, Chat GPT is notorious for mansplaining. for mansplaining, and I think and I think like it does have like a I feel like it has an attitude, and uh, you know I think that this happens too with like Alexa and Siri, like they have yes, a kind, it exactly kind of like what a, happens. <laughs> that's exactly like a pro, where it comes from because some sort of like say, proto personality. Off, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. I would get off stages and people would be like. Why does Alexa yell at me when I do this? And I'm like, <laughs> I promise you it's not yelling. But you interpret it this way, especially, um, you know, for lots of reasons. But we, this is part of the game. Like we are doing, we are trying to mimic human behavior. And as a result, we also have to anticipate human reception. And that's why there's a lot of different ways to tune how we respond, how friendly and colorful that response is, how authoritative it is. These are all you know, dials that we need to measure as we are thinking about using this in a production environment. Yeah, definitely. None and of those I do dials think are that, pressed in yeah. for this. So do you so. think that they should sort of let you pick your sort of personality for your chat GPT or like, you know, chat GPT, I'm like a little sad. So treat me, you know, I don't know, make me happy or something. I mean, I mean, no, can, I can think, you even um, do that sort of thing? The reality is, is that we're we're training GPT every day with every query that we make against it, right? Mm -hmm. So someone, though, does have to say, hey, I'd like you to send me a response in this format to teach it that that's a format worth responding in. 
So yeah, there, we, and that's the art of prompt engineering, right? This kind of new mm. work that's going to have to happen. Because even if we use GPT, um, a GPT model, and honestly, there's lots of ways to create a chat GPT experience inside an enterprise where either you're using a enterprise license of chat GPT from OpenAI or their, their partnership with Microsoft, right? And you're using Azure OpenAI. There's lots of ways to, to, to implement it. But when you do implement it, you want to make sure that Yes, that you are customizing it for those scenarios. You know your customer. If you're, you know, a, a, a company like a retailer, right, you know we're the fun retailer and we kind of joke with you along the way. You want that to show up in your conversational responses. And it can. GPT can be trained to do that. Yeah. So what do you think about this talk where, um, you know, Bing, the, the chat GPT version of Bing has been experiencing some, I don't know what to call it. Oops, sorry some, um, I don't know, issues with how it's answering things. Like, it feels like if you talk to it too long, it starts kind of going off the rails a little bit. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so that's, I, I'll, I'll, re, I'll kind of revisit the idea of, you know, many of us are confused about the idea that ChatGPT is the thing. It is only mm -hmm. a window into the thing. The thing is actually this engine that's been trained. And we're mm -hmm. training it every day with our queries. But if you're an, you know, if you're going to use this for a reason, you'll want to create your own version of this, train it on your mm -hmm. own data, and, and educate the model. I always call they're like little children. You're going to teach it <laughs> what the right thing is, how to That's respond. Great. You're going to tell it when it's wrong, and you're going to teach it how to be right. And you're going to do that for as long as we both shall live. Like like That's AI right. doesn't get old. You know, it doesn't get older from that perspective. Like it constantly learns. And what is most important is that it's also learning and amplifying patterns it finds in the data you're training on that you didn't even know were there. And that's when mm. we see things like, I won't mention it because it hurts people, but AI gone wrong, right? Certain bots mm. that have gone the wrong way. And not only do they become wrong, but they become racist and then biased and, and sexist and like start hurting people's feelings. Yeah, on they purpose, go nuts. Which is kind of what you're referring to, <laughs> right? Like, uh, it's why really, you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's real but weird because it's a it's sort of like a program that is a facsimile facsimile of um human interactions. And so it can like yes. move in those ways. And I and I feel like I don't know, I, I tend to feel that a lot of people are trying to are trying to make it like go wrong. I don't know that it's necessarily as bad as people think. I mean, I think you have to learn how to use it and 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 use it for the right things because you can make it say bad things if you prompt it enough and you try to make it, you know, trick it into being mean and stuff. But I don't know. I, I still find exactly. it pretty useful. Um, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, well, it's definitely useful. I just think we don't want to get locked into thinking chat GPT is, is the thing. Like chat GPT is just mm -hmm. an example of the thing. It's a it's the first time ever that the world has been able to hop into a chat box with an AI model, but that AI model is not like, that's not the only AI model in the world. There's lots of them and we can actually create our own. And that's where I think the the nuance is in the fine tuning that you're not mm. stuck using ChatGPT as is. You can make ChatGPT for retail, for healthcare, for finance industries, right? I'm not gonna use ChatGPT to educate an analyst on very specific company data because GPT doesn't know that yet, but I could create a, a financial version, right? A GPT banking, mm -hmm. Um, version that's now ChatGPT, but I know banking. I know the words, the terminology. I know the use cases, right? I can teach that to that model. Someone yesterday was talking about, what if we just went and got all the books about a subject and trained it on those books? Because that's not mm -hmm. the way ChatGPT Ch isn't trained on the books. And I said, even that's a little problematic, right? Because humans wrote those books. And let's just face it, some books are good and some are horrible. <laughs> and now we're asking- yeah, yeah. ChatGPT to write books for us. <laughs> this would be interesting, like just train ChatGPT on romance novels, like that. You know, <laughs> if you like hyper focus on any specific thing, or you know, science fiction. Uh, you know, yeah, that interesting, interesting sort of thoughts. And I think that we're just at the beginning. What we have figured out are the things that m make it seem human. I know I end up thinking ChatGPT all the time, and. I find myself talking to it like a per like if it was a person for some reason, and it's because yes. it's that good. It's gotten that yeah. good at mimicking 
how humans interact. And so it feels like it's a person. Uh, yes. Although, but like you're saying, it is just yes, it's the not. thing fact, that it's kind of the engine that can be, you know, made into something else. Yes. And, and that we control the efficacy and we control the moderation of that something else, right? Like there's a lot of, we have a lot of control in this. Like we are not a victim of chat GPT. Like we don't just have to use it and be like, wow, that didn't answer my question. I don't understand why that's broken. We can actually train chat GPT. I always tell people though, like you're training a research model that's used by everyone. So if you're inside mm -hmm. a company and you want it to, I just want to see what this is, know that the queries you're using are being used to train a model that your competitors are using. So mm -hmm. there's there's not a, that's not a safe space, right? It's a great place to play around and see what's possible. I actually will tell you a funny story. I used ChatGPT. I asked it to create for me synthetic data for an internal GPT solution, right? So I was like, hey, I really just need a conversation between an agent and a customer um, that is gonna sell them something. And I think I said, sell them a insurance policy. I'd like them to ask a few questions about that policy. And if you could create 10 across 10 industries um, with that are similar but different, that would be great. Enter, and it created 10 examples. And I was like, wow. okay, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, it's not <laughs> great data, but it's enough for me to model something, right? Now that, that before I would have had to figure out how to procure that data, get scrubbed version, like, it's a longer road where now I can immediately start a map I can do from a data science perspective now that I've got a simplified data set. And I think hmm. maybe that leads to one other thing that I'll mention is that when we're thinking about tuning this model, the biggest difference, one of the, I mean, I've mentioned a few big differences, but one of the biggest differences is that it does it because it's trained on so much data, you need very little data, like a small data set to train it on your special thing. And that hmm. has been a blogger. Many people didn't use AI because they couldn't figure out their data story holistically enough to make use of AI models. Now, now, this kind of model gives a window for us to use it with a much smaller data set. And I think that's huge opportunity. So, and thanks everybody in the chat. It's great to see you all. Eric, awesome points. Um, and, and Michael, mm -hmm. great to see you all. <laughs> Yeah, I want to bring up a couple of things here. So David is saying, and this is from one of our earlier conversations, that there's a comparable debate that has gone on for years among woodworkers using software and a CNC router isn't considered real working, but using conventional power tools to achieve the same result is. And it's like what I tell people. Sometimes I say like, oh, I was reading this book, but I really just heard it as an audio book. And people are like, that's not reading. I'm like, well, like... <laughs> You know, like I'm absorbing the content. I mean, what do I call it? A, you know, listening to the book. Uh, so there's always, you know, people that kind of bring up that. Um, yeah. Like if you're, you know, the, the, the thing that you mentioned about it not being art, there are so many amazing tools. And uh, where do you think some of the stuff is going? What kind of things are you kind of impressed with? Um, you know, with generative AI that you've seen, I, I really like what you said about the smaller data sets. I feel like people thought that ChatGPT4 was going to be just, you know, I think it was 175 billion parameters. So maybe a thousand billion or whatever. Right, and right, I'm right. thinking like, like seven, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking like, you know, at some point, like you don't need that many more parameters. Uh, and Ronnie Cher, one of uh, the guests as we've had in some other shows earlier, was mentioning that maybe the answer is like smaller data sets to solve specific problems. So what are some of the things happening that you're really excited about? You mentioned some, mentioned some good examples, but what are some of the things maybe yes, in the well, visual I'm sense? I'm always, uh, and a few of our, our watchers, listeners will appreciate this. Mm -hmm. I'm always a bit responsibly AI focused in my approach to these technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just really use cases with higher risk. So uh, I'm mm. very worried about like data lineage and how we preserve data lineage as we use these technologies that are built on people's data. Uh, someone made this data. Who owns mm. it? How is it used? Like, um, so, so Codex, for example, is probably the most impactful. And Codex, for those of you not familiar, represents it's like the GPT for software engineering, right? For code, mm -hmm. for writing software. And some of you have played around with GPT to write software, but imagine if it actually knew the nuances of Java and Python and COBOL, right? Like that's where the, the art of that is. Um, but the challenge with that, of course, is that it's built on repositories that had relatively vague um, user agreements and EULAs that they've assigned. And mm -hmm. we're like, wait, 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 I didn't know you were gonna use it for this purpose. I would not have let that happen if that, and so because of that litigation, it's just more risky. And I I stay, I'm, I'm 
consciously kind of putting it in a category of like, yes, but with rigor, like with a lot more rigor around the process of how I might develop that. But there's huge opportunity there uh, to re- yeah, you I feel know, like there used to be a concept that where uh, people would think of products as beta and I think we've lost a little bit of it and so I think this LinkedIn users bringing some of these issues up sure. that you're talking about that some of the the models are trained on questionable materials some use copyrighted materials yes. other quickly learn yes. to be racist so yeah you're talking about those things that I think uh, honestly it's it's too bad that we don't consider some of these things beta and i think maybe that was some of like google's resistance to kind of like come up come out with a product because there are so many potential issues but yeah. if you just don't release it as, as production mm-hmm. like that's what i mean yeah. there, who whose stock market price goes down when you launch a beta product like it's unheard <laughs> of like we were all and it was kind of weird everyone felt like google got picked on because we're all launching broken stuff. Like all of it mm-hmm. goes wrong. Mm-hmm. And they kind of got punished for that, which was, it was interesting just to watch the market's reaction in that case, because mm-hmm. it does indicate like, hey, do we not understand? Like there's a huge statement at the bottom of every window we are all in in chat, GPT, that says, this is a research model used for research purposes. You know, do, yeah, like, yeah. do not pass go, do not drive, you know, away, don't drive heavy machinery using this product. Like, <laughs> There is, it's known. So mm-hmm. I do think that's a level of awareness, but also someone else in the in the chat was mentioning, like with all new things, this is what happens. We are like in the early days, like months into this mm-hmm. launch. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see us evolve that understanding and awareness, which is why this kind of show is so good because we can evolve people's awareness of what this really does mean. Like ChatGPT isn't the thing, it's the art of being able to create generative answers. So now mm-hmm. the very next question should be, okay, what data do we train on it to get the best generative answer? And if you go to ChatGPT, that decision's already been made for you. You don't Mm -hmm. have that option. And so we have to really rethink and reframe this solution as a tool in your toolbox, not necessarily the box itself (laughs) that you're, you're limited in using. Yeah, so there's been so much movement in this space, uh, and I think that uh, Daisy kind of says it yes, really hi, well Daisy, here. Daisy, what's up? <laughs> this says, uh, this can scare a lot of people. How do you get them excited? But at the same time, helping them understand kind of the responsibility factor and whose responsibility is it? I mean, that's yes. that's what you were talking about a little bit. So, yeah, so I, uh, I, this is my job all, I mean, all day long. This is what I do. But one of the things is to paint the picture around what can be done. So I build demos. Um, all the time. Like I'm, you can, of course, demo write in chat GPT, but I like to take it a step further and show people what it looks like to custom train a model. And you get them excited about, oh, this could know my company, this could know my problem, this could know my school. Like it could, you could actually build your own dedicated Encyclopedia Britannica for us old folk people who know what that is, right? In the context of a chat GPT custom to a domain. And that is very powerful. We'll see that evolve more and more over over the next year, probably the next five years. Um, but I also think it's really important. Every exciting, wonderful keynote that I do is followed by and actually interspersed with, by the way, there's a black mirror path here <laughs> that we should be aware of. <laughs> yeah. You're not letting mm-hmm. a single conversation go by without saying AI can go wrong. And it, the reason it goes wrong is often due to lack of oversight that we fire and forget, we put it into production, we're kind of like, it's good, yay, it's out the door. And what we don't realize is that it requires consistent verification of data, consistent fine tuning, consistent um, moderation of what comes out of it, especially in a generative model, to ensure that patterns, bias, are not amplified over time in any model. And they will be if you don't monitor it, no matter what. Every massive model found, like LLM has experienced what happens when you build on humanity, <laughs> right? Is that, and, then, and that becomes our job to moderate. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of ethical questions that we need to figure out, you know, what happens uh, when, you know, people are spreading questionable deep fakes. Uh, what do you think about, is there any recourse or what sort of things should we do to make sure that um, you know, society's thinking about those issues. But at the same time, I think we still need to, um, you know, 
remain excited because there's a lot of exciting things yeah. about the technology that you're mentioning. And I think that people see ChatGPT, people see the visual things. Like I made some great pictures of my dog, Mojo, the coding dog. Yeah, it's yeah. like Mojo is an Egyptian, like Mojo, yeah, yeah, like exactly, uh, Space exactly. Mojo. And it's so much fun. But there's like all these other openings now for all kinds of technologies. And I think you're in the middle of it, you know, showing people that you can make these smaller models that can do really cool things. You know, uh, I think we talked to an, an ethicist. I mean, I don't think we talked to Ayodele Dubella a few weeks ago oh, talking yeah. about those ethical issues. And those are super important to take. What are your thoughts on, on the ethical issues? Like, what, what about these frameworks that are coming up? What things should we be doing as a society to sort of figure that out? Yeah, I mean, the good news is, is that this is new. As a matter of fact, we have some ethicists in our chat right now <laughs> that are very <laughs> deeply passionate about this. Um, it's not a new thing. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the work we've done, a lot of the work that Microsoft has done to create packages that can be added to any of these models. Like, mm -hmm. all, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at, for example, even embeddings, right, it's a, it's a Jupyter notebook. And we can then import packages that can help with explainability, that can help with transparency. We can actually use AI to help us identify bias and um, figure out processes for mitigating it. So I think the good news is that we can build on top of the momentum that already exists in responsible AI. And now I, you know, now I kind of use the term responsible generative AI um, as just an extension of that work that we still need to have a enterprise framework that this sits in when we use it. We still need to do the right data pre-processing. That's an activity that still has to happen, right? Um, we also need to make sure that content moderation is happening, that asset management. What happens when you start generating as a company millions of pictures? Who's managing that mm. stuff? Where is it going? And how do we di distinguish that from one that's not generated? And that's where I think like the Adobe's of the world will likely come in and provide some level of a stamp. I don't know if you know this, but Microsoft and Facebook Meta both did a hackathon around deep fakes for deep fake um, analysis and most importantly, mm -hmm. deep fake identification. So how could I just get something on a page in Twitter, say, by the way, what you're looking at is synthesized. That work mm. has been done. Like there's actually a deep fake detector model that's used. Um, we can't get to it as normal humans only like law enforcement and, um, you know, schools, I think like there's a specific demo or, or I don't know, demographic kind of, of people that have access to that through Microsoft's program. But like I said, that's work, that's work that's done that we're integrating now into a generative AI mo uh, process. The challenge I think is that most people don't think of it as AI in that traditional sense. They kind of think of it as like mm. a website. And, and mm -hmm. so we need to like back them up and be like, no, this is an ecosystem of products in order to maintain the integrity of the entire system, you're going to need to have some safeguards in place. Yeah, I think definitely. We've seen some examples of that. So, for example, we saw this company in Korea basically create deep fakes for some of their newscasters. And yes. um, then they decided that, well, you know, maybe we don't need the newscasters. Like, we can just, like, do all of the news shows without actually having to have any people. And that's what this is actually an example. Uh, so this person, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, agreed to have, you know, a specific news show done with the deep fake. But then, um, you know, they tried to make this into a technology and so those are maybe the type of things that we need to watch out for because we want something like that. Yeah, and just make you know. sure that the lineage of this data is protected. Like her persona is now going to be used. This is where mm -hmm. I, I always infuse blockchain. Like I want to I want to be on that blockchain. So if you use my face, if you use my likeness, I'm going to be transactionally attached to its usage forever. <laughs> That's how it should yes. be. Um, as opposed to what happened kind of like with the voice of Siri, right? Like. She signed off on a temp contract, you know, 2,500 bucks or whatever is. I'm, I'm joking. I don't know the details of it, but I do know it was a human and I do know they signed off and they don't get royalties mm -hmm. every time we hear, you know, from her, from her likeness. And so how do we make sure, yes, that people's likenesses are valued and that we don't turn into just a new version of kind of what we're doing now, which is certain companies making lots of money on people's data and mm -hmm. the people who gave that data not seeing that value return to them. 
Yeah, and honestly, now you can actually generate people who are not real people that look like real people. You know, yes. the, the AIs are good enough to generate completely like unique individuals that right. don't really have any of those issues. So, I mean, I have I have a, an example of something that happened when I was in in, the, in working at radio station. So, you know, when um, the radio station started to track listenership a lot more accurately. One of the things that happened is that, of course, they found that people basically turn the radio off when they, uh, you know, when you when you stop hearing music, when commercials start playing, or also when some of the DJs would start talking. And so yeah. they decided to launch all these radio stations without any people in them. So like all these pre-programmed radio stations, and occasionally they would have like a one announcer for like the entire station do the sort of hits and things that they needed to do, introduce this and that and the other, the branding and, and such. But what they found out was that the the people are actual assets that they can use. So if you're a local station and you want to say that you're going to go, I, I, I'm around the in Orlando, in the Orlando area. So if you want to say, oh, we're going to be at SeaWorld today and you can meet our famous people from the radio station, like you lose the ability of have branding that is people based because those people don't really exist. Yes. And so they immediately went back the other way. They turned it around because they realized, oh, we forgot that the people are actually assets that we can send to like do hits at different yes. places. We can send them to clubs. We can that's send right. them to and, and do things with them. So I think them, people want to be associated yeah. with them. Like that's the whole exactly. influencer marketing concept. And you can't, which is what lots of organizations are realizing, you can't replace that with an artificial persona because that mm -hmm. relationship is never built. And if that persona shows up somewhere, people don't go, oh, I can't wait, I wanna go and meet them. They're gonna be here for the first yeah. time. Like they're, that's all lost and it's very powerful marketing. So that happened a long time ago, and I'm, and I think that that we're going to see something similar with all these, uh, you know, some of these tools that allow you to just generate, you know, fake humans that that yeah. will do the well, same thing. The, the the actual. Go ahead, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I think part of it also is that we're recognizing there's now research around what um, what robots are good at, right? What avatars are really good for, right? So one mm. of them is um, robots are really good at giving bad news like sale information <laughs> or you missed you missed out on a seat because we don't take it personally. We don't think the person on the phone or on the other end of the, the message is like trying to get is out for us or doesn't like us or whatever. Right. We, mm. we just take bad news and we're like, well, it's a robot. Like, what does it have? OK, so we're we're cognitively more receptive to bad news from a robot. And we're also cognitively more receptive to good news from a human. And so as an organization, we can now strategize what we use a robot for with the least amount of impact to customer satisfaction and that what is we so use smart a human for. Like, and this is all research based yeah so i'm like oh i like if we're intentional we could do this the right way where we everyone everyone wins and these are the stories to your point earlier around how do we evangelize this how do we talk about mm. this we tell good stories and then we also you know i always t it's the hero's journey right like we're mm. on this great Awesome! Yay! We hit a roadblock, which is ethics. Something bad happens. This ro this uh, blender bot went rogue. But don't worry. Here's four other reasons why we're, do we're we're continuing along this path. And I think that's we have to do that. We can't have a conversation about generative AI without talking about the risks. But we also need to heavily lean into the opportunities because it's our responsibility to take advantage of those opportunities. And if we focus too much on the risks, we'll never jump ahead. We'll never jump into that blue ocean, right, of, of mm. opportunity and generative AI. And then you'll miss all the good stuff that comes with that. And then the black mirror wins. And let's face it, mm. nobody wants that to happen. Definitely. So if you miss your flight, robot, if you won a prize, then real person. Got it. That's fantastic. Right. That's <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's like, you know, there's no, there's nothing quite that makes you more angry than like, you know, those variable like rates when you miss a flight and all of a sudden you're paying like three times the amount. Yes, Perfect exactly. robot so situation. You, you don't want a human answering those types of scenarios actually is mm -hmm. less effective than if a robot gives that information. I love that. That's, it was an HBR study. Mm -hmm. Someone can look it up. I'll probably try and find it and throw it in the chat. But it was fascinating, fascinating study. Cool. Let's take a couple of questions. We're we're almost out of time here, but we'll take a couple of questions. Sorry, this is actually a question from before. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Interesting thought. It has always seemed to be quantity first, and I wonder if uh, the whole new industry focus uh, on AI data quality will crop up. This is probably something that you've been working on, right? Oh, on, I would on say that that's the quality their, for yeah. sure. 
we're there now, right? Like there is an mm -hmm. entire industry. Um, I've actually shared the stage with people who are the CEOs of these companies that talk about solely about inclusive data set acquisition as a service, right? Mm. So um, interesting. Yeah, that's already. Yeah, I think that there is so much acceleration in this market right now that all those things that people are probably concerned about, you know, there's a lot of like uh, ethical frameworks that are, are being put together by countries. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of work in the kind of work that you were doing right? as well. So yes. We're not new to this, right? We've been doing no. AI in production at least since Alexa uh, from a, a, democratiz a democratization yeah. perspective. But long before that, right? Like Turing yeah. test was in the 50s. This is not a new thing. People have been worried about responsible use of this technology for just as long. Um, so mm -hmm. a lot of these technologies are not only are they available, but they're actually quite mature. I and mean, some of them are mm -hmm. a few years old. I say mature in the, um, you know, innovative bleeding edge tech sense, right? Meaning that they've been out a while. We've used them in in enterprise scenarios. They're at they're operating at scale. Um, but I don't say mature in the sense that they've been around for a decade. Like we're, we're not there. That's just not the world we're living in right now. Things get built last year and we're like, it's ready. <laughs> or in this case, <laughs> Things get built in November, and we're all talking about it right now. <laughs> all right, I'll do one more question. So Catherine is saying, regarding the basketball hey, scenario, could that could that mess with people's reward response? You see yourself performing like a pro, but 99% of your day is on the couch. Yes. Yeah, there's got to be something in there with, uh, you know, doing sort of a... Uh, you know, uh, like, like the armchair quarterbacks, the people that are sitting down yeah. on their couch to get them like more involved. I think there's a, a lot of possibilities. I don't know that that NBA example was the right one, but I think that there's a lot was, of work that can be done. It wasn't the right one for you, but I don't know that oh, you yeah, were right. their target persona, right? You're probably so, right. <laughs> and and you're, I think to your point, maybe they weren't even intentional, but I know from talking to like CXOs and like the chief experience officers and companies, like they're looking at customer experience, but very much from a segmentation. Like, what can I do to this segment? Especially my buyers that are the ones buying box seats, the ones that buy all the merch. Mm -hmm. Who are those people and how do I get them excited? Oh my gosh, those are the ones who in their mind, they're already visualizing themselves in the game. So to, to build something like this is a bit of a gimmick, right? Of course, mm -hmm. but it's also very much in alignment with the vision they have for themselves as a segment of that audience. So that's what our job is, is right to match the technology and be very personalized, very segmented mm. in our ability to deliver a good experience for the right person at the right time. And before that was hard to scale because we'd have to have people do all that work with generative mm. AI. We now can actually generate that work with some with less information from the people side. We still need the people part. We just need less of it to scale it across more segments. And I think that's going to be a huge opportunity for many organizations this year. Yeah, and I think that um, perhaps when I was in high school playing basketball, something that could have helped me, some sort of AI that could tell me, yeah. hey, you know, you're moving like this, oh, yeah. you know, step it up, step it up. Like you're not shooting yeah, properly, mean, like teaching me things. Sure. I think that's a definitely, my, uh, you know, a great my way. My husband, actually, I bought him these things that go on his shoes. He's a soccer player. And um, mm -hmm. it's like, I, you know, I'm, of course, I'm all about precision soccer. So I'm like, put these things on and it tracks <laughs> like how, how fast he's running, how hard he kicks the ball, how many times he touched it. Um, all of these metrics that he can now use to get a baseline for his performance, which he never had visibility into before, um, even as a, you know, an amateur player. Uh, but yeah, I think that that is definitely... Again, that's not an, a generative AI thing, but it's definitely an evolution of like, how do we just get better as humanity? We mm -hmm. get visibility. And a lot of these AI tools and technologies are giving us increased visibility to things that we can get better at. Super exciting. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with me. I did want to mention that we have an amazing guest also coming up next week, uh, Dr. John Maida. We're going to be talking about the role of art and design and how, for example, now that computers can generate things like images, photos, uh, you know, all kinds of environments without, uh, you know, people, what does that mean for people who are creating things and what they've been doing? So, um, you know, it's a really exciting time, I think. There's a lot of, um, of things that could be happening. What are your thoughts on this? And is there anything that you would like to ask John? Yeah, so I actually uh, was involved. You remember the NFT craze, right? Did that happen? Yes. I can't. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah. it's real, but uh, <laughs> Web during 3 the NFT, NF craze, yeah. In the beginning of that, I was doing a lot of like art meets tech conversations, mm -hmm. and so one, of course, would be like, 
what happened there. Um, <laughs> <that'd> be, like, <laughs> I would love to understand what he thinks happened um, in that transition uh, because it was, it was actually very similar to this craze we have now, right? Where everyone, even people like in blue collar jobs were investing in NFTs, right? And mm -hmm. how do we like control the hype in those scenarios? I was doing as much as I could to control the hype. But the other thing really comes down to my brother is an artist. He was a creative director at Twitter for over a decade before, you know, it happened. And he uh, he came to me immediately and was like, you're into this generative AI stuff. Like, what's going on with this? I'm an artist. How do I control people using my ideas, right? My imagery, my stylistic form in their generative work like that. I don't want mm. to do that. And a lot of people at the beginning, kind of like at Alexa, at the beginning, everyone opted into giving data to a model they didn't fully understand. They didn't fully mm. understand how it would be used or how many people would have access to it. And as a result, right now there's exposure in a way that an artist is like, wait, shouldn't I get credit for this somehow? And it's almost mm. like too late to sign those rights away. And so how do I think that's an interesting uh, you know, avenue to go down is like, how do we protect the people who are building the art, these models, that's allowing other people to create art they're making money off of. And again, mm. I'll, I'll, I'll whisper blockchain. Um, like <laughs> we've got tech for this and this is a yeah. great application, but we're not quite there yet from a, an implementation of that um, from that I, perspective. I think that what you said before is totally right, that people are focused on what the technology does, not sort of what the technology is about. Like yeah. NFTs, blockchain, like all those things are just technology that can be applied. Like maybe one of the ways that you can prove that it's you or not you is some sort of NFT that, you know, verifies yes. that this video from Zelensky, it can actually in real That's time, right. you guarantee that it came from, you know, that it's That's really right. him. And There's a lot of technologies, yeah. That have that mm -hmm. right like that says this exactly. came from me yes oh yeah that's a great idea that's a billion Super. dollar idea someone yeah <laughs> uh, i well, you know i come up with good ideas every now and then I know, all right but so uh, the listeners will implement it <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so definitely, um, if you want to help out, just you enjoy the show and you want to help it out, go ahead and go to this URL, the go.rabo.org slash TFIT and like and subscribe. We have, we created a page a while back that lets you just access all the content. I usually do some clips from our conversations with people so you can have a more condensed kind of the best stuff, the specific show that we, uh, that we did. So thank you so much. Uh, Noel yes. for being here. So exciting. I am here. so happy to have you. And uh, again, we'll see everybody again. Uh, and I'll go back and uh, answer some of the chat questions later on. <laughs> Take care, Noel. Goodbye. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for having me, Ray. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.